So good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you, Raniero. And um, I'm very grateful to the organizers of this seminar for inviting me. And thanks to everybody for being here, of course. I'm Sara Borrillo, a researcher at University Oriental in Naples and professor of Islamic law at University Roma III. Uh, I, my main research interests are related with uh, gender, gender politics, Islam and social movements in Morocco and Tunisia. And in particular, I was working uh, more on Morocco. Uh, since 2016, I work also on Tunisia. I um, work on the relation between gender politics, Islam, and social movements. I was working also crossing the 2011 uprisings. In, I was in Morocco, I was living there. And then uh, after that, I published the work about the constitutionalization of gender equality in the constitutions of Morocco and Tunisia, analyzing the top-down and, and bottom-up demands, the top-down policies and the, top, and the bottom-up demands for gender equality. And now I'm working on the um, new forms of activism through cultural and knowledge production in the region. Uh, and together with some colleagues, we just published a special dossier of Studi Magrebini journal edited by Brill about activism and culture and knowledge production for egalitarian citizenship. So these are my main research interests and uh, today then we will explore a particular part of my work. So thank you very much and I give you the floor. So, um, uh, Denis, would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you very much. My name is Denis Kalic. I'm from uh, Anadolu University. Turkey, and we, we are working with uh, Professor Nizi Orhon and Duygu Keçeli. Uh, and uh, now we are uh, preparing uh, our uh, meetings and uh, we are uh, working on it. So uh, uh, my uh, major is journalism, actually and also uh, Duygu, so uh, she did. And uh, uh, the gender is very important things in our uh, country and uh, Islamic uh, behavior and believing is very important. Uh, generally, uh, Islamic rules is uh, uh, mm, on uh, gender issues and very effect and uh, very uh, uh, hard uh, issues. So uh, I think uh, in name of me, uh, uh, we are uh, very uh, happy to in this uh, meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Denise. Doigo, would you like to introduce yourself? Of course. Thank you very much. I'm Doigo from Anadolu University Journalism Department. Uh, I'm working on media parts of this project in Turkey. Um, I'm in Journalism Department and worked on gender on my master and working on activism and social movements. Ah, in my great. PhD right now, so I'm very excited for this training. Thank you very much. Okay. Chloe. Hi everyone, I'm Chloe. I'm joining you from Italy. Um, I have a background in international relations and global development. Uh, and at the moment, I am a colleague of Luisa and Yelena from Cesia. Okay. Um, and I'm a, a project manager uh, and I have projects related to gender equality and sex education in uh, teenagers and young people. Uh, so, yeah. I have I've managed different projects on the topic, so I'm I'm really excited to to learn some more from you today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gloria. Now Esther. 
Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Esther, and um, I studied at the Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna. And uh, now I'm currently working. Uh, I'm from Budapest, Hungary, and uh, I am joining you also for, uh, from Hungary now. And I work uh, at an organization here called Kalumba uh, that um, supports uh, refugees and asylum seekers living in Budapest through housing and educational programs. And um, uh, the, actually the news of, uh, of the training came through my organization. So this is how uh, I could join. Um, and the, the reason I'm really excited about this uh, training is because I would, it's been a long term plan of mine to organize a kind of um, women's circle within, the, within uh, our organization or a community space when, uh, when of course it, it's possible um, after the, the virus. And um, uh, I would like to use also some tools of uh, art and uh, communal artistic practice, but I think that I could also learn maybe some, uh, some good practices uh, in the in the framework of this training so thank, thank you. you sir so in, in in hungary the partner of uh, the race project is a, a, an ngo called the menedek yes yeah uh, exactly uh, it's a different one but um yeah. we are in contact with them and yeah. they sent us in, the in, this possibility in, of in, the in, in each country we have created uh, a so-called action research unit ARU which is, uh, uh, let's say, coordinated by the partner, local partner of RISE. In case of Hungary, it is, it is Menedek. In, in the case of Italy, it's Cesia, for instance. Uh, and in Turkey, it's, uh, it's Anadolu University. But they have aggregated around them a number of other stakeholders which support them in delivering the, uh, the inclusion strategies. So last but not least, uh, Kurt William, please. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm joining this meeting from uh, Batman, a city in southeastern part of the Turkey. Uh, I'm uh, currently working on um, refugee protection uh, in a, a humanitarian aid organization. Uh, I learned uh, this um, course uh, from uh, Nizi Horhon. Uh, and the topic is very interesting for me. Uh, I think it will help my uh, professional life uh, in here in Batman. Uh, thank you very much. So, Sarah, as you can see, the expectations are very high. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't want to put pressure on you. But no, I, no, no, no. But um, sure it's going uh, to be easy. So you can start. Go ahead. Thank you, thank you. Uh, but your background are really interesting and challenging to me. So, uh, of course, uh, we will have some uh, some Q and A sessions, and we can discuss, uh, of course, and we can uh, explore more some points that are not so clear, and uh, or we can go beyond this presentation also. Thanks to your experience, uh, uh, we can, of course, um, uh, say more. <laughs> okay, so uh, I share my screen and I will share with you a PowerPoint presentation. And uh, so I start with it. I keep, okay, I keep here. Um, could you please confirm that I'm sharing my PowerPoint? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. And uh, okay, here uh, you have also my email, but of course uh, uh, we can then keep in touch um, as you prefer. Okay. So uh, as maybe some of you already know, uh, this is a geographical map. Um, and uh, I use it very often to start my courses in the introduction, in, in, in the introduct 
lecture session because uh, this map uh, allows me to propose a different point of view compared to the current visions of the world that, for example, are hegemonic here in Italy or in Europe about the Middle East and North Africa region. Uh, as maybe you already can see, this is the Mediterranean, but we have the North and the South. What we have the habitus to see as the North and the South that are in another position. And this is a map of Ali Drisi. Um, he was working at the um, Norman court in Sicily. So the Sicily is the center of his vision of the Mediterranean. And we have the North Africa in the north. And we have Italy and Europe in the south. So in this map allows me to discuss, to, to criticize the vision that is um, very often diffused in the media and in the current visions of the world of the Western countries about the relations between uh, the relationship between women's rights and Islam, women's movements and Islam. This is a issue that is often analyzed through the assumption that Islam is the responsible of the old discrimination of the ensemble of the discriminations against women. And this idea is connected with two uh, false assumptions. First one, this idea is based on a monolithic and a uh, historicized understanding of Islam that is, of course, inspired by a single holy book, the Quran, but that assume, assumes multiple articulations from a spiritual, doctrinal, juridical, and normative point of view in the different contexts where it is eradicated and performed. Second, in a similar way, women in the Muslim majority countries and in the Middle East and North Africa in particular are considered very often in the West as an homogeneous ensemble of eternal victims of patriarchy in a very orientalistic, colonial, salvific, when not Islamophobic perspective. These ideas are legitimized by the concept that empowerment of women, gender equality, interact always with Islam in a relation of opposition. Beyond this dichotomy, I will try to demonstrate the complexity of the reality throughout the case of Morocco. I would like to explore how in Morocco gender equality, empowerment, as well as Islam, in some cases we will see, correspond with a heterogeneity of discourses, policies and social practices that are performed, negotiated and contested by civil society, the state, and we will see more um, in few minutes. So um, these are our uh, identified needs and demands. And um, I will examine today uh, throughout an historical, a historical perspective the evolution of women's movements in a long durée perspective in Morocco. So, of course, we will explore the basic meaning of empowerment and gender mainstreaming. And uh, we will explore how empowerment and gender equality uh, have been incorporated in Moroccan gender policies. Um, we will offer some examples of the main policies for women's empowerment uh, in Morocco. And we will explore beyond the top-down policies how social um, actors demand gender equality. So how um, social actors claim women's empowerment in many different ways according to ideological um, and uh, other kinds of affiliations um, divide. All these led us to explore 
some of the following questions. What about substantial gender equality in the definition of Moroccan citizenship today? And what strategies are carried out to claim women's rights in the restructured post uprising political context? So we will explore uh, through how our historical overview, the women's movement, um, uh, process, building process and the women's movement uh, change um, during the 20th century, we will explore how during the 90s Morocco incorporated in its uh, policies gender equality and, uh, and women's empowerment and we will explore how and what is changed uh, after 2011 uh, Moroccan uprising and after the constitutionalization of gender equality uh, in the country. Um, we will also explore uh, the reconfiguration of the secular component of Moroccan women's movement and its relation with the Islamist women, in, so the women activists in the Islamist uh, associations and groups and the feminism of the intellectual, the critical intellectual, so the Islamic feminist theology of liberation, that is another very important component of the civil society in Morocco, but in particular of the global network of the um, critical thinkers, critical reformists uh, that reinterpret, re read Quran and the sacred sources of uh, Islamic law. This is a tentative of agenda today. We will see if we can do all this. And of course, we will have uh, some Q&A sessions. And now we are starting in late. So I will try to address all, the, uh, all our um, aims, uh, all, our, all our learning objects, objectives of today. Um, all these issues are here analyzed between two main categories. We have on the left side uh, an image that describes gender policies, top-down gender policies um, adopted by the Moroccan case in a top-down dynamic. In particular here we have an image of the national campaign for the electoral reform of 2002 that encouraged women to vote and not to cook. Here, a Moroccan women, a woman that is traditionally dressed uh, votes and crosses. Uh, she is crossing over a man that is dressed in a Western modern dresses that gives her a tagine, a traditional um, tagine. On the other hand, we have a photo that I took in Rabat during the 20 February movement demonstrations in 2012. So one year after uh, the 2011 Moroccan uprisings in the context of uh, the so-called uh, Arab uprisings or uh, revolutionary mobilization in all the entire region. And we read here Aisha Shab, long life long life to the people in Arabic and this is a very important declaration in a country that is a monarchy and in a country where normally we say and we hear long life to the king so this is an image that declarates that women's rights and women activism is part of the entire society uh, change uh, democratic change and women's rights could be understood as human's rights in a very wide in a, in a sorry in a wider process for a democratic change of the society uh, in this image we can also see for example that women were part of the Moroccan uprising and according with different social political religious component even though very often women have been invisibilized, invisibilized, sorry. 
So how our focus today is women empowerment between gender policies and social movements. In my work, I use a gender approach to history and social sciences. Here, gender is conceived as a social cultural attribute imposed on a sexualized body through dispositives of power that with Foucault we can define and we can uh, understand gender as a useful category of analysis with John Scott. At the same time, we have to keep into account the category of intersectionality that defines power not only along the axis of gender, but also along the other axes of class and race. And these three axes give us a very comprehensive understanding of how power functions and how discriminations are um, created, uh, produced and reproduced in our society. In my field work, I use uh, ethnography and participant observation and oral sources that are combined with, with written sources. Oral sources are very uh, useful to explore, according to Luisa Passerini, Alessandro Portelli, uh, some of the most important oral historians in Italy. Um, oral sources are useful to explore and to reconstruct the past and the present from the point of view of the ones that have built and that are building this post and the present. In my work, I explore so micro stories that make the macro history and they are very important because, for example, we can explore the background, the biographies of the social actors. And with a photograph, I created a photo narrative project. And here today, I introduce you um, the protagonist of this photo is uh, the first uh, woman taxi driver in Casablanca. And uh, in this photo narrative project, I explore with a photograph uh, a series of uh, women biography, uh, Moroccan women biographies from Morocco. And this project helps uh, us in, uh, in describe different kinds of uh, trajectories of life, different kinds of empowerment, different cows, uh, uh, kinds of ways through which women in their ordinary life uh, search um, emancipation, struggle for emancipation. And let's have a look now to the macro history, to the collective history. Here we have a photo of the 8th March 2015. Uh, we are in the Avenue Mohammedan V in Rabat, in the capital of Morocco. And yes, as we know, and as we see, Moroccan women are in the public sphere. They, uh, we can say they still are in the, in the public sphere. Uh, in the street, in the square, they occupy a square for claiming their rights. Uh, Moroccan women's movement mobilization as well as uh, Moroccan women movements in all the entire Middle East and North Africa region is characterized by differences articulated by the dimensions of ethnicity. For example, in Morocco, we have the Arab Berber or Amazir uh, divide. We have the class divide. We have differences along the class, education, generation, religious, ideological, political uh, dimensions. So our starting point of today is the deconstruction of two categories. The first one is the category of Muslim woman of the third world that is normally conceived as a victim, unable to demand their autodetermination, not educated, not politicized, and not involved in the public sphere. Of course, these categories by Mohanty, Chandra Talpade Mohanty, and in the 80s, um, uh, the global academia were, used, were using the, the category of the third world that today is not at all uh, used. And we are talking about uh, developing countries, or I prefer the notion of 
in our case, Middle East and North Africa countries uh, without using any uh, categories connected with the uh, first, second, third world, but here I'm just quoting Mohanty. And a second category that we want to deconstruct in our work is the category of Muslim women with the hijab, where the hijab is the symbol of all the inabilities of a Muslim woman of uh, the third world in, uh, uh, to emancipate herself. This is something that is very common in the, some Western um, visions of the world, even in some feminist scholarship. Um, so my interest today is to um, explore the meaning of empowerment, emancipation, gender equality, feminism, that are here today understood as fluid categories that are contested and not at all standardized. So even though in our classifications we have to understand social phenomena with some solid categories that help us in our work, it is also very important to explore the self-definitions of social actors paying attention to their subjectivities and their claims according to Gayatri Spivak. So let's see what's empowerment mean in the international arena. Empowerment is understood and defined uh, according to international institutions and in particular uh, to United Nations. It consists in a process promoting and consolidating personal abilities and also the awareness of one's own abilities. Empowerment is a process that concerns self-confidence, knowledge, economic and intellectual power, so also critical capacity, but also social power. And so it can include social respect, authority, and empowerment is also connected with the political part of our discourse, so with policies that promote active participation in decision-making process. This is just one very large definition that can uh, include different levels of dimensions that uh, we are exploring today. So the individual, the social and the political level. Moser defines empowerment as the ability of women, in particular when we speak about women's empowerment, to increase their own autonomy and internal strength. This is identified as the right to make choices in life and to influence the direction of change through the ability to gain control over tangible and intangible resources. And this is a definition that is very connected with agency as the capacity, the ability to um, change um, her, his, her own life through autodetermination, to the ability to orient uh, his, her own uh, choices. Gender equality is another very important concept in our discourse of today. As we already know, gender equality is the third of the eight millennium development goals promoted by the United Nations in, the, um, in 2000. The Millennium Declaration commits the member states to promote gender equality and the empowerment of women as a means of combating power, poverty and promoting development that is truly sustainable. The elaboration of the Millennium Objectives derives from the commitment of United Nations headquarters of the proposals put forward in the Third World Conference of Women in Beijing in 1995 and the sanctioned principles of the Convention on the Elimination of All the Forms of Discrimination Against Women adopted by the United Nations General Assembly in uh, 1979 and transposed from uh, 170 countries but many of these with reservations and 
the majority of the countries that adopted uh, the CEDAW Convention, the Convention on the Elimination of All the Forms of Discrimination Against Women, many of the Arab countries adopted this convention with preservation. Um, promote equality between men and women uh, is very important for human development. Uh, so with a development that is really, truly sustainable, and not only for the individuals, but for the communities in their complex. Gender equality is a concept meaning on the one hand that every human being is free to develop his, her own attitudes and to make choices, regardless of the restrictions imposed by the roles reserved for women and men, and on the other hand, that the various behaviors, aspirations, and needs of women and men are considered, appreciated, and promoted by an equal point of view. This is a definition of Lydin, but we also can explore the um, several definitions that the UN uh, agencies propose about gender equality. Another very important concept for human development in our discourse is gender mainstreaming. This is an approach, a strategy, promoted by the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations in 1997 in order to promote equality between men and women in development policies, in research, in legislative processes, in the planning and implementation of projects and programs focused on development. To this end, the United Nations encourages the adoption of positive discrimination measures to strengthen opportunities, guarantee citizenship rights, and in particular, the access to education, training, work, um, UN promote female participation in political representation systems, in eliminating all the forms of violence against women. And human development, and this is the last concept in this first introductory session, uh, human development is a concept developed at the end of the 80s by UNDP, United Nations Development Program. Uh, and this is a very broad concept that crosses the traditional meaning of development, focused only on the economic growth. According to this concept, all the country uh, can achieve development by following some, step, some steps that are functional uh, for the economic uh, change. For example, the theory of the stage of development of Rostov, of Rostov that provides for some economic steps in order to achieve an economic development. But we know that we need also a human uh, dimension in order to promote uh, sustainable development that includes also education, work, um, uh, freedom of choice, freedom of expression, autodetermination, and we can say human agency. Um, we um, have considered already the Convention on the Elimination of, Against uh, All Discrimination against women, uh, the International Convention of 1979. And as we know, many countries from the Middle East and North Africa adopted it uh, with many reservations. And in particular, Morocco in 1993 um, adopted uh, this uh, convention, this international convention. But we um, observed that the country have a lot of reservations, in particular when this convention interact in, a opposition, in an oppositional way with the family code, the national family code. Um, so the civil status of women and men, in particular in our case about women. So what about Islam in Morocco? In this scenario, we have to observe that Islam is used by Morocco as a dispositive of power. Morocco is a monarchy where the power of the king of the Alawi dynasty, 
in Morocco, uh, based in Morocco since the 17th century, has a Islamic legitimation because of his descendant from the Prophet. So there is a very direct link, connection, um, descendancy between the King of Morocco and the Prophet Muhammad. Islam is also so important in the codification of the personal status code or family code. Just few informations here about the relation with colonization. The country uh, in 1956 was independent from the French control that lasts in Morocco from 1912 until 1956. And Morocco is in itself protagonist of a colonial process in the Western Sahara, since this stopped to be under the Spanish control in 1975. We can note that Islam is used in Morocco as a dispositive of power in order to discipline citizens and their relations of power. In Morocco, as well as in other Muslim majority countries, it is possible to identify a close relations between relationship between Islam, central power, and patriarchal social order. In addition to this, the construction of Islamic legal and ritual knowledge is a very important for the legitimization of the central power. Morocco is a monarchy, as we already have explored here, where Islam has a central role that emerges from the double title of the king. He, the king, he, he is the head of the state and also the commander of the believers, in Arabic, the Amir al-Mu'minin. This conformity is present also in the Moroccan constitution, even in the most recent text of Moroccan constitution of 2011 that has been approved after the uprising animated by the 20 February movement in uh, 2011. It is possible to observe the accordance of the constitutional version with the symbolic pillars of the nation based on the Islamic legitimacy of the central power, territorial continuity and integrity, and monarchy, as it is well explained by the national formula Allah al Watan al Malik, so God, Homeland, the King. These are the three pillars of the nation state in Morocco. At the social level, the family represents the institution for maintaining the social patriarchal order, which after the independence obtained in 1956, was codified in the personal status code. The personal status quo, in Arabic, the Mudawana, has been reformed in 1993 for the first time, and then in 2004, thanks to the lobbying activity, the advocacy activity, the plaidoyer of the feminist movement, um, that has been uh, a very important social for force for the reform of the family code. This code is inspired by Islam, as well as the political power that is nourished by the structures that produce, organize, and spread official Islamic discourse. Therefore, the Islamic power is a guarantee of both central, political, and patriarchal power. Therefore, the democratization of family relations is a fundamental point, a fundamental dimension for the democratization of the entire society. We can observe that public and private are not separate spheres. The private is political, and in Muslim majority countries, and in Morocco in particular, uh, as Ziba Mir Hossein says, the theological is political. 
So here, my research is uh, conceived in a historical and sociological perspective, but we can uh, here explore in a historical perspective the evolution of the historical uh, path of Moroccan women's movement, trying to analyze its main continuities and turning points in relation with the national history in the 20th century, of course, until today. Then, in a sociological perspective, we can explore what are, in the last years, the main discourses and goals and uh, political strategies. We can explore the emancipatory practices claiming women's rights in Morocco in a bottom-up uh, perspective. So, we can uh, isolate the first phase of women's movement in Morocco, a women's movement that moved its first steps in relation with the national liberation movement, so at the beginning of the 20th century. Women of the elite participated in the national uh, circles, in the national movements. So we have the example of Malik al Fassi, that was the only one woman that participated in the writing of the Manifesto for Independence. She was one of the protagonists of uh, the participation of women in the press. And she was one of the first uh, figures, intellectual figures, that demanded the, um, the right of um, women, of education, uh, the right of education of women. The press was an important instrument for the first female voices that demanding women's rights. And first of all, primary education. In the first uh, part of the 20th century, we observed the, emer the emergence of charitable associations until the creation of the association Sister of Purity, Ahawat Safa, in 1936, that according with Fatima Sadiqi is the first feminist organization. Why? because this association demanded also rights for women beyond the primary education, and in particular, rights to work, the abolition of polygamy and marital repudiation. So this association was the first one in demanding really a reform of the personal status code and of women's rights that are disciplined by the Islamic family code. We can also explore a second phase in women's movement uh, in Morocco. After the independence, women are involved in uh, political parties, but uh, women's rights remain a second class priority in the agenda of political parties. So women's emancipation was a rhetorical instrument uh, in the national building process. Uh, also uh, before the importance of women in the national building process is uh, crucial in the discourse of many reformists, also in other countries, like for example in Egypt, we see how women are um, presented as a very important actor in national building process, but mainly as mothers, mainly as mothers of the citizens, mainly as mothers in charge of the care of, of citizens, of the son, of, uh, in, chair, in charge of the care of the husbands. So this very patronizing vision uh, in the national building process starts to be challenged in, in the post-colonial phase, but in political parties, even if we have some women inside the political parties, the political parties consider women's rights always as a second-class priority, okay? It, it also in, in the post-colonial phase. So women participate in uh, political parties, trade unions, students' movements, uh, mass protest movements. We have in Morocco, just after the independence, in 1962, the starting phase of a very rep repressive period 
that uh, lasts until 90s. So we have 30 years of état d'exception. So a very repressive phase um, with um, um, authorities that repress uh, mass protests, mass mobilization, leftist parties, leftist movements. Women are in society, so they participate in social movements and also um, in uh, political activities and they suffer a severe repression during the years of lead that lasts until 90s. But uh, we have also to observe that women are not only part of the leftist uh, social movements, but they also participate in the Islamist uh, social movements. Of course, in the 70s and then in the 80s, women are also activists in this part of the society, in the Islamist social movements that in Morocco are very um, uh, heterogeneous, we can say. We, we don't have only one Islamist actor, of course. We have a lot of associations and groups, and then we have the uh, building of the PGD party, the um, party for the justice and development that has been uh, one of the main actors in the post-Arab revolution phase. So we can start in finding to, in this phase a dichotomy, a dichotomy between the leftist uh, social actors and the Islamist social actors. And in the 70s and the, in the 80s in particular, we start to uh, observe uh, the, the, the creation of the first associations that we can call with uh, um, Zakia, uh, Zakia Daoud, that is a very important historic uh, um, scholar in Morocco, we can start to observe the creation of a historical feminism, a, a fighting feminism. So, so we find the, the first two important associations of the secular feminism in Morocco that are uh, the union of the feminine uh, action, l'union de l'action féminine in French, and uh, in French, the association, uh, uh, sorry, Association Democratique des Femmes du Maroc, the association, the democratic association of women from Morocco. These are the two uh, main associations that came from two leftist party. The Organisation pour l'Action Démocratique et Populaire, uh, so the organization for the action, for the democratic action and for the popular action, and the PPS, uh, Le Parti du Progrès du Socialisme, so the socialist party, hmm? the progressive party. And we are in the 80s, so women understand that women's priorities, women's rights are a second class priority, even in the leftist party. So they create a specific association. They said, okay, thank you very much. Now we do by ourselves. <laughs> we experimented, we tried it. It was not the case. Okay, bye bye. Of course, they collaborate with the leftist party and with trade unions. A lot of women activists of these associations came from, came from uh, the trade unions. And this is a very important point because the left is always connected with the right to work, with the independence, the economic autonomy of the individual and of women in particular in our case. This is a very Marxist uh, understanding of rights. And of course, when we have when we have the economic independence, the economic autonomy, we can also be free in our choices in society. We have not to depend from our husband in case we are married, of course. But this is also interesting, in, a very interesting point because we have to know, and we know, of course, already, I think here that all the sexual relations, all the legal sexual relations in our context in Morocco, as well as in all Muslim majority countries, uh, can exist only in marriage. And 
the husband, according to the family code, has the economic responsibility of women, of the uh, wife, and of the entire family. So this is a very important point that connects Islam, the family order, the social order. If men are responsible for women, and this is something that is written also in Quran, in, in Quranic text. Rijal Kawamun al Nisa. This is a very important topic, Kiwama, the responsibility of men on women. And then we will see how Islamic feminists and the reformists, uh, feminist theologians, reconsider, reinterpret this concept. If men are responsible of women, why women have to work? Why women have to be economically independent? So <laughs> this is a circle. Hmm? If Islam dictates uh, the responsibility of men and women, maybe women cannot work, but this produces uh, relations of dependency in terms of uh, economic dependence, and also this can um, become a relation of obedience. Hmm? So there is a, an interesting um, link between economic rights, autonomy, independence, freedom, and what Islam says and how Islam, in the particular Quran, uh, has been uh, interpreted and um, how Islam has been interpreted in family code in particular. This is uh, a very important, uh, I, I say, a, a crucial key question, a crucial key issue in changing family code, in changing the understanding of Islam and in particular of Quran, and in changing the, the uh, economic and human rights of women. If we don't change the understanding of Islam, maybe we cannot change the family code uh, that for the, this country is, is a law. <laughs> so we cannot go in, um, against the law. Uh, secular feminist organization, so uh, they strive for gender equality, but in particular, they start in struggling for women autonomy in the economic field, women freedom, of course, uh, in society, in politics, they struggle for education, for trainings, for the right for women to uh, university uh, education and trainings. And um, so for them, for the secular leftist organization of the feminist movement, what is the meaning of empowerment? Empowerment means, as we see, education, work, freedom. So they have a particular interpretation uh, of empowerment they give a meaning to this word in a particular sense then uh, in this uh, image we can see that uh, we have secular feminist associations on the top of the image and then we have also as we already said um, islamist activists women activists in the islamist movement and for them also empowerment assumes other connotations, other interpretations. For example, uh, women activists of uh, Islamist movement considered that Islam already dignified women. So with revelation, women obtained their dignity. In Arabic, Islam karamat al mar'a. So they are okay with Islam and we, with the interpretation of Islam that is done in Morocco. As we know, in Morocco, um, there is Maliki Islam. Maliki is one of the main uh, juridical schools hmm, we have in the Islamic countries, as you already know, four main juridical school in, in Morocco there is um, the Maliki school that informs 
um, uh, the, the, the juridical, institutional Islam um, at the national uh, level. So, um, according with Maliki Islam, the women uh, of the Islamist movement accept that Islam disciplines uh, social relations, political relations, family relations. So, in this case, we are at uh, March we are participating with women in this image during some street demonstrations. We have two marches, one in favor of the reform of the family code on the top of the image, and down here um, we have women against the reform of the family code that have in their hands the Quran, because the family code is inspired by Maliki Islam, uh, and in particular the Maliki interpretation of uh, the Sharia, hmm? the Islamic law. This is very interesting because interesting because um, we are normally um, we normally understand this relationship between the secular feminists and the Islamist women activists as an oppositional as a dichotomy, as a confrontation. This is true, of course, they have different themes, they have different discourses, the base of women's rights are different. For example, in the case of secular feminists, uh, citizenship is the first uh, legitimation of women's rights. They have, women have, as all citizens, to live in a uh, état de loi, hmm? in a rule of law country where Islam is not uh, the base of individual rights, of citizens' rights, uh, while Islamists consider that Islam is the first source that defines the individual and then there is the citizenship. Uh, one of the, the women activists that I met in Morocco say, first of all, I'm a Muslim and then I am a Moroccan citizen. This is very interesting. What defines us and our identity um, first? For some of the activists that I met in the Islamist movement, Islam is the first definition of ourself, of ourself in, this, in that case. So uh, we have an oppositional dichotomy, but also historically we can find that there are some negotiations, some interaction, according to Fatima Sadiqi and Zakia Salime, that are two scholars, two Moroccan scholars of women's movement, um, women's of secular feminist associations and women in Islamist uh, associations and groups, they negotiated and uh, they um, interacted a lot during last uh, uh, during last years, uh, during last we can say starting from the seventies, during last fifty years now. So uh, this is a very interesting point. Uh, we have a dichotomy, an oppositional dichotomy, but we can find also some convergences. For example, in the methods of contention in the methods of um, uh, organizing a street march, in the methods of organizing a petition. So how they claim women's rights. The framework of their discourse is different, but somehow, sometimes the, the methods of contention, the methods of uh, uh, an, an organization of a street march is similar. And uh, they are in a, dichotomical op opposition, but somehow uh, one group um, has been replying to the other hmm, historically. So this is also interesting to understand uh, uh, social movements and different social groups as part of a broader uh, framework, uh, but not as a separated uh, uh, groups, but as interacting groups. This is uh, the web page of the Democratic Association of the uh, Moroccan Women, the Association Democratique des Femmes du Maroc. Um, this is a very interesting point because, uh, of course, they use a lot media. Media is a key 
instrument for advocacy, um, activity, for uh, claiming women's rights. And uh, um, I present here uh, this, um, this web page because um, one of the first points, uh, one of the first sections of the website is dedicated to violence against women and in particular to uh, struggle uh, against violence on women and um, this association in network with many others. In Morocco there are a lot of um, associations for women's rights according to a secular perspective we can say. Um, um, they struggle against women, against violence on women with uh, a lot of uh, methodologies that are based mainly on the uh, uh, Centre de um, on the creation of a network of uh, civil operators that help women in, uh, for example, in the trial uh, for divorce with the, with the husband, in the trying to denounce uh, the violence. This is, this, this is the first difficult step in uh, trying to, to stop violence against women. A lot of women accept violence of their husband, accept uh, um, male violence on their body uh, because um, in the majority of the cases, um, we have um, a, a social acceptance of the violence against women. Once I was in a taxi in Morocco and I asked why there is this social phenomena, uh, this is so um, wider so, social phenomena. And the taxi driver answered me, is Allah that wants this. And this is another misperception of the Quranic test. And uh, uh, in the Quran, there is a, a point uh, where it is written that um, the, 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 the man has the power to, uh, to orient uh, women uh, behaviors. Uh, but sometimes uh, uh, when there are conflicts between women and men, men at the fourth level, so after three level, uh, uh, go away, try to discuss, etc., can uh, orient the, the behavior of women um, with an object, okay, that is useful to, um, to clean the feet <laughs> of, um, of people. And um, this is something that is very traditional, but that this is, has been interpreted as the power of men to use violence against women. This is another very important point that uh, theologians and um, reformist feminist uh, theologians are reread in order to, uh, to combat, to struggle against violence on women. Um, this is the photo on the other side. This is the photo of one of the most important Islamist activists in Morocco. She's the leader of Al Adla Wali Hassan movement, uh, justice and charity movement, that is a um, Sufi oriented uh, Islamist association that is also critical toward the monarchy. And uh, this association has been created by the Sheikh Sufi Abdeslam Yassin, that is the father of uh, Nadia Yassin. And the, the, this intellectual figure, Nadia Yassin, is very interesting because she has been the leader of this movement, of the feminine section of this movement. And she has organized some trainings for women in order to empower women throughout Islamic knowledge. So she has another point of view on empowerment. Um, the Islamist section of women in the Islamist association, al adl Alexan, for example, uh, understands empowerment in an Islamic framework, but she doesn't agree, for example, with the violence against women and with the legitimization of violence against women. So Nadia Yassin uh, has um, tried to empower women in knowing more Islam in order to counter 
discourses on uh, women's discriminations that are legitimized by uh, other Muslims. So this is a very uh, interesting um, process that she has been led uh, in, uh, in uh, Rabat, uh, in Saleh, and in many cities of the country, but then authority repressed this movement that, as I said, was anti-monarchy, was against the monarchy, and in particular was for the republic, uh, was the, for the republic, sorry for my English. Um, then we have uh, the third way. So we have a first uh, feminist movement with a secular um, vision of the world and of citizenship. Then we have women activists in the Islamist movement. And then we have the third way of Islamic feminism. What is Islamic feminism? Islamic feminism is a transnational discourse that aims at a deep egalitarian access first to religious discourse and to religious institutions based on women's rights to have the necessary authority to reread and to interpret sacred texts. For example, we have a very well known at an international level, we have a very well known scholar in this field, uh, Amina Wadud. She calls um, uh, Islamic feminism, she calls Islamic feminism and gender jihad. So um, from this perspective, the religious authority can contribute to putting Islamic patriarchal tradition under discussion. And in a critical way, it is possible to affirm gender equality in society. This approach, so gender jihad, Islamic feminism, demonstrates that feminism and Islam are not ontologically opposed. And some uh, of the intellectuals of this um, critical, vague, uh, critical um, perspective are inspired by a reformist vision of Islamic ethics. This perspective, in fact, aims at demonstrating the full compatibility between the message of the revelation and gender equality. Firstly, from a spiritual point of view, and then at the social, political, juridical, and economic level. Okay, so this is a very another, uh, this is a very interesting uh, um, uh, point. We have a, a network, a transnational network of thinkers, of women thinkers, that are scholars, theologians, that are um, sometimes that are jurists, scholar, uh, like for example, Ziba Mirosseini. In Morocco, Fatima Mernissi started this uh, perspective of thinking, and she started uh, the rereading of the Hadith, of the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad. And she offered another point of view, another reading of this uh, Sunnah, of some of the uh, Hadith that compose Sunnah. And today, um, Asma Lambrabet is one of the most important uh, thinkers of Islamic feminism. Here I wrote some of the most important works of uh, Fatima Mernissi that is a very well known author at an international level and even in Italy is very well known. We have also some translations of her novels and of her essays. Um, the Veil and the Male Elite, for example, has been one of the most important uh, essays of uh, Fatima Mernissi. The subtitle is exactly a feminist interpretation of women's rights in Islam, for example. Uh, Fatima Mernissi died in 2015. She didn't define herself as Islamic feminist, but her work is uh, understood as many uh, other scholars say as Islamic feminist. Uh, Asma Lamrabet is a biologist, but she uh, started to follow the path of Fatima Mernissi in this uh, rereading of sacred texts 
uh, in this reinterpretation of Islam, and she became the director of the Center for the Studies and Research on Women Issues in Islam of the League of Ulama in Rabat. So her case is very, very important in order to understand how Islamic feminism arrived in a very institutional uh, structure uh, that is very important in the construction of the legal official Islam in Morocco. Then, uh, Asma Lamrabet, after some years of a very critical work inside one of the most official institutions of the official Islam, uh, she um, left because she agrees with the gender equality um, in the redistribution of wealth in the family, in the um, inheritance. As you know, inheritance in, is one of the most blocked part of the uh, family code, but she stressed that women and men has to have to receive the same part of the inheritance. And this is something that is not allowed in a Muslim majority countries and in Morocco it's not allowed. And the family code um, provides a specific redistribution of inheritance and normally, not always, but normally women receive the half of the part that uh, the, the brother of the male uh, receives. So this is a very, um, this is another uh, voice uh, in terms of how empowerment is understood, conceived, how empowerment can allow women in claiming uh, their rights. And here empowerment and in particular power is connected with religious authority. And so with capacity to elaborate a counter discourse, so a different discourse that is based in the Islamic framework, but it is aware of the possibility to criticize the hegemonic discourse that is inspired by Islam. So it is, this is another point of view about how empowerment can be articulated by uh, civil society, by activists, by intellectuals. So we have economic rights, economic independence, uh, freedom of choice in the first case, so secular leftist feminist uh, associations. Then we have Islam that orient um, that is the base of women's rights, but also we have uh, some critical voices like we saw with, uh, with Nadia Yassin, and then we have the right to access to Islamic knowledge, authority, uh, in the case of Islamic feminists. And here, that is the, we can say, the synthesis of this first part of uh, the presentation. So we have secular feminists that respect a particular ideological framework, they um, consider that human rights, uh, women's rights are human rights according to international conventions for human rights, uh, and that Islam has to be, uh, has to uh, guide, has to orient the private sphere, not the public sphere of the citizens. Their emancipatory objective is gender equality and not gender complementarity that is the emancipatory objective of uh, the female islamist uh, activism complementarity is a very important key concept in our discourse because complementarity is conceived to be uh, the crucial principle that organize family okay so men are uh, charged um, of the reproductive work, women are charged of the are in charge of the productive works so of the care and the economy of the care in the domestic space. Islamic feminism tries to offer a third way, uh, so uh, 
a woman can be respected as a human right, but a woman can also um, be Muslim. So the Muslim identity um, is not conceived as oppositional with the feminist identity or with uh, activism uh, uh, for women's rights and Islam and gender equality can be uh, totally compatible. Uh, at this point, I, I and um, I tried to describe the main ideological frameworks of these three components of Moroccan women's movement through the lens of two dimensions, uh, the adhesion to our universalistic narrative of human rights or Islam and the, emancip the emancipatory objective of their approach. So secular feminists consider the preeminence of universalistic narrative of human rights. They claim for a modern stud, a state of law where Islam rests, remains in the private spiritual sphere of the citizens and their emancipatory horizon is gender equality. Uh, Islamist activists consider Islam the source of their identity and of the ideal state and of the ideal society. So their ideological reference is Islam and also uh, it is crucial for their emancipation within complementarity. And then the third macro group is um, the group of Islamic feminists that consider Islam and gender equality as fully compatible. So these are three macro, macro categories to understand how empowerment and women's empowerment in particular could be understood. Then, uh, coming back to our phases of uh, historical women's uh, historical overview on, uh, on women's movement in Morocco, we could explore the third phase that starts in the 90s. So the regime, Moroccan regime, opened the gate to the multipartitism uh, throughout the so-called democratic transitions that seems to be eternal and opened the gates also to the demands of the feminist movement, but in a partial way. In 1992, the two main associations of the Moroccan secular feminism mm, demanded through a one medium campaign the reform of the family code that was reformed by the King Hassan II in 1993. Even though these reforms was symbolic and more symbolic than effective, it was an important reform because the code that was inspired by Sharia uh, since its adoption in 1956-57 was never reformed. So it was a very important first time. Since then, we can count other gender policies. Uh, policies. The new electoral code that provides for a quota system for women uh, in the parliament and at the local councils and a second and more important reform of the family code in 2004. These reforms, uh, this reform is very important because now the husband and the wife are, are co-responsible in family and the wife should not be obedient to the husband. Before 2004, the law said that a wife has to uh, be obedient toward the husband. Then the 2004 reform uh, reduced polygamy to two wives and uh, established the right for women to initiate a legal divorce. In 2004, uh, we uh, explore now another very important reform, the reform of the Ministry of Islamic Affairs that institutionalized the figure of the women preacher of Islam in the mosque. Uh, women preachers, Murshidat, uh, have the task of teaching other women the right Islam in the mosques and encourage uh, women in knowing 
uh, more about Islam, family law. This reform encouraged also the public activity of women scholars, experts in Islamic law that participate in the construction of uh, national Islam, Alimat. So we have two levels of uh, religious authority that became institutionalized in this year, women preacher and women scholar uh, in Islamic studies, we can say in uh, Islamic law. These, um, so these two levels of authority, religious authority corresponds um, correspond to different roles, uh, which consist in the case of the women preachers in guide uh, other women in the understanding uh, of Islam through a simplification of Islam. Mm, on the other hand, the production of Islamic knowledge is something that women scholars can contribute in doing. So after a uh, training peri period, uh, women preachers, official women preachers of Moroccan state um, can work in mosques and also in the schools of the country. Their job consists in religious teaching for women and also for children. So it's like a social work uh, with a religious background, of course. Uh, the Murshidat's classes are structured to address specific uh, issues of family law, but also ethics and relationships within the family and so with the husband and with neighbors. Classes often include explaining and reciting Quran, its exegesis in an, uh, in an official, of course, perspective. And in this regard, Sometimes they have to teach Moroccan, Arabic, and Arabic, classical Arabic, because some women are not educated in Arabic. There are also counseling sessions where women discuss their social and psychological problems. So uh, this uh, new uh, women preacher, this new official women preachers is another important actor in Morocco, uh, in Morocco that promotes another type of empowerment. So uh, women preachers of Islam, of official Islam, teach a modern, non-violent and moderate Islam in conformity with the pillars of national Islam, which are articulated in a book manual, this guide for the imam and for the preachers, and we can also explore uh, the work of these uh, preachers and women scholars of official Islam throughout a journal that they started to publish in 2011. This is uh, uh, an image, a photo of uh, one of the most important women of um, official Islam, Fatima al Kabash, that was one of the first diplomats at Faisal Karawin University in 1957. So she is the symbol of the involvement of women in the official Islam, but that follows a very um, structured discourse that is, um, of course, the discourse of the national official Islam that is very patriarchal. <clears throat> this is a, a schema that allows us to see how uh, women participate in the Islamic structures, in the official Islamic structures of the country of, and of the religious powers. So they are um, present at the Ministry of Islamic Affairs, they participate in the Superior Council of um, uh, Ulama uh, and in religion, in regional, com in regional, sorry, commissions uh, of Ulama. Uh, women are um, in the League of Ulama, the Rabbit al Muhammadiyah. They participate in the first um, and in the most important school for Ulama that is based in Rabat, that is the Dar al Hadith, the house of the Hadith. 
um, in honor of the King Hassan, Dar al Hadith Tasmiya in Rabat. Uh, women are also preachers in uh, religious TV and uh, religious radio. And uh, they participate in the Rus Hassaniyah, in these classes that some ulama give in front of the king during the month of uh, Ramadan. And women are also professors of fiqh, sharia, and uh, Islamic studies at university. So uh, this is an, an interesting uh, other um, perspective in order to understand how empowerment is interpreted in a top-down policy. How state tries to combine the notion of gender equality, the gender participation in the political sphere, in the public sphere, and in this case in the religious sphere, throughout controlling the transmission of the official religious discourse, but also enjoying uh, the capacity of women to be <clears throat> uh, close to other women. Uh, what uh, here, what is the, the aim of this uh, um, particular reform? Okay, what is the objective of this particular reform? But here we can say that. Uh, we can observe a religious authority that is something important, of course, in the public sphere uh, of this country, on the, of the region, of the entire region. And we can also observe that um, women preachers and women scholars are characterized by a form of agency. They are... <clears throat> they are... Um, uh, social actors, they have a religious agency that can be identified through piety, social recognition and civic engagement. So they are a sort of docile agent, according to Sabah Mahmoud, that leads a sort of pedagogy of persuasion. So <clears throat> uh, they, they are a key actor in promoting uh, uh, official discourse that is close to women uh, and mostly to women in rural areas, in marginalized areas, uh, women that are not educated are the target group of these women preachers. And uh, the, the reasons of the reforms, the objectives of the reform, but uh, we can uh, surely um, understand that the contents of these discourses uh, are not compatible with the gender equality uh, promoted by the feminist associations, but women preachers and women scholars promote a discourse about gender relationships that is oriented toward gender complementarity. Uh, but at the same time, um, these docile agents are protagonists of a process of change because the recognition of women's religious authority could underline women's empowerment, facilitated the acquisition of women's rights, maybe in the future. Um, and maybe also a critical point of view could enter uh, in these um, discussions about Islam, in these classes about Islam. Women can reflect together in a protected space. So this is also something very important and something new. Um, gender and Islam here appear as dispositives of power. So here we can say how we can see how Morocco uses the, the, the rhetorical gender mainstreaming, the adaptation of uh, uh, the national structures, institutions to the gender mainstreaming that is promoted at an international level. But this uh, adaptation is, of course, um, goes in the direction of the legitimization of national Islam. So this is another uh, perspective that allows us to understand how empowerment is interpreted and is uh, um, conceived by uh, 
uh, nation state along a historical uh, with we already saw a historical overview and in particular this reform on how islam and gender uh, uh, are reconceived by uh, state so um, coming back to our periodization what 2011 uprising changed in morocco this is my take of the birthday cake of the 20 february movement um, here we are in rabat in the moroccan trade union in 2012 so people from the 20 february movement the moroccan version of arab uprising the so-called arab uprising uh, organized a birthday party of the movement and this is the cake so the movement was composed by a very large spectrum of social forces from the Islamists to the left wings, from the Salafi to the ecologists, to the feminists too. After a few weeks of mobilization, the top down new constitution has been adopted and the constitution, the new constitution of Morocco today uh, recognized gender equality equality between women and men Mosawa by Nalgin Saini but um, gender equality is recognized in conformity with the laws and the constants of the country so in the first part of the 19th article of the constitution gender equality is declared but in the second part of the same article gender equality is under other laws and among other laws of the country we have also the family code for example that discriminates women in some uh, fields like example like for example the inheritance and in other kinds of uh, uh, fields so we have gender equality but at the same time we don't have full and substantial gender equality after the constitution then <clears throat> Uh, that was adopted in July 2011. In October, we had the elections and the um, Justice and Development Party won, the Islamist Party won the elections, but we had only one woman uh, among the ministries. So we have gender equality in the constitution and this is the first government of 2011 after the so-called Moroccan uprising. And of course, this woman was the Ministry of Women Affairs, Family and Social Solidarity. Okay, so the constitution was approved in a very top-down dynamic, a very big debate, fractured historical feminists and independent activists into the, February, the 20 February movement. Historical feminists like the associations of the secular feminists supported the approval of the constitution and uh, this because of the recognition in the text of the constitution of the gender equality but the independent activists of uh, the 20 february movement uh, were against the referendum for the new constitution because the constitution was written by a committee that was chosen by the king so this was not a really democratic process like for example in tunisia uh, the people elected an constituent assembly that proposed different versions of constitutions and then uh, on the base on the base of this constitution we had other elections so um a lot of scholars say that 2011 uprisings were just only youth protests, but this is, was not the case. Um, in Morocco, for example, we of course observe a youth massive participation, but there is a very important continuity between the old generation of activists and the new one. And in this photo, we can observe uh, with the two of the uh, feminist activists uh, this continuity. We have in the middle uh, historical leftist secular activists, Amina Tafnut, 
And on the right side, we have a young uh, activist, Salma Mahroub, of the independent feminist activists of the 20 February movement. And we see also a hand here, and she is uh, the mother of Salma that is confronting herself with the policemen. And so we have also the involvement of other subjects, for example, the mothers of the young activists that were involved in the protests thanks to their daughters and son, of course. So this is a very interesting photo that allows us to understand the generational continuity in the activism in the case of Morocco but also in other cases we can say and so feminism uh, passes through different generations but of course it changes it changes its discourses its methods of contentions its aims its goals its um, of course its actors and after 2011, of course, in the, in the street protests, we uh, know that people demanded social justice, bread, freedom, dignity. In particular, dignity, karama, was a crucial keyword of uh, the 2011 mass protests. But after that, after 2011, in Morocco, but also in other MENA countries, we observe a sexual turn, according to Zakia Salime, a scholar of uh, gender studies in Islamic context, we observe a sexual turn, um, a particular um, interest in claiming individual rights, individual freedoms, and also sexual and reproductive rights, in particular for women, that are the most discriminated uh, subjects in society, together with other kinds of minorities, racism, racist minorities, and also sexual minorities like LGBTQ community. So, for example, we started to observe struggles for the end of minority marriages, struggles for the right to, um, to have abortion, struggle against violence against women, and uh, art, and in this case, for example, theater, in order to denounce public, publicly women uh, discriminations against women. In this case, we have a uh, very interesting performance uh, uh, based on real, uh, real stories of women, on their sexuality and on their life, private life. The Ali is a word that refers to something that is mine. So the sexuality, the vagina. And this is something, this is a piece, a performance, uh, a theater performance that uses uh, real voices of women collected through an atelier. Uh, uh, and this uh, theater piece uh, was censored by authorities in 2012 because, of course, it uh, puts under discussions one of the main taboos, for example, virginity in the family, okay, or sexual violence against women during the first night of marriage, and so on and so forth. Then uh, we can also refer to the alternative movement for individual freedom, in French, uh, the acronym is Mali, that struggles for the right to uh, a non-therapeutic abortion that is uh, not permitted in Morocco, not allowed in Morocco and uh, also for LGBTQ rights. This is a very dramatic photo um, uh, for the campaign uh, for the rights uh, to non-therapeutic abortion because a lot of clandestine abortion then are uh, practices uh, daily in the country. And uh, here we have a photo that explains, uh, uh, would like to explain how media are important in order to visibilize these new kinds of struggles that are um, present on the, on the Moroccan uh, scenario. And here another kind of uh, mass protests in order to um, struggle for the right to uh, wear a skirt uh, in the public space. 
So after 2011, um, we observe how women, but not only women, also men, are struggling for a reappropriation of the public space, a reconfiguration of the public space. And in this case, in particular, um, uh, we refer to a case um, of violence in the public space. Two women were objects uh, of violence by some men. They were to the police station in order to denounce this violence, but they were scared. They were considered part of this, uh, of this problem. So they were considered to attempt to uh sorry they were considered to uh, they were considered a menace to the moral order to the public order and so uh, for the panel code uh, you can uh, be in trial for wearing a skirt if a policeman considered this so after this case the, that was uh, very much mediatized in the country um, the campaign where a skirt is not a crime uh, was diffused in order to uh, claiming um, the right to reconfigure the public space uh, according to freedom. Um, another important campaign, a uh, very recent campaign, is a campaign about the right to love. As we already said, the only legal union between a woman and a man are, per me, uh, are in the family, uh, in the marriage. Um, so, uh, what about all these kind of sexual relationships that are out of a marriage? Uh, according to the penal code, this is not uh, possible, uh, and the, these kind of relations are penalized. Um, but uh, recently, people in Morocco, and in particular women that are more discriminated, started in demanding the right to love also out of the marriage. So there is another campaign that is love is not a crime. That is a campaign that tries to criticize the, 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 the obligation of marriage. And also this campaign uh, led also other individuals like LGBTQ community on the scenario. Because we, after um, feminist movements, we can observe in the historical line also the emergence of new social actors that are the LGBTQ communities. So I stop myself here because I think that we don't have uh, time, but um, um, my purpose was also to analyze uh, uh, international cooperation project in which I was involved uh, in 2009 and this project was uh, called <laughs> in French, uh, Renforcement de Capacité d'Intervention des Organisations de Base pour la Préservation des Écosystèmes Oasiens au Maroc. It was established in the south of Morocco in the Oasis context by CIS, an ONG, an Italian ONG, financed by European Union. And this was another case, another interesting case in order to observe how an international cooperation project could promote another kind of empowerment. So what's the meaning of empowerment in a context such as this one, where uh, land rights, uh, right to water, uh, uh, the right to taking part in a decision process of a community that is ruled by traditional uh, rules, uh, so how does empowerment change when we observe a different context and how international cooperation can intervene in a community uh, through an international cooperation project? But this is another very important topic that maybe in the future we can discuss uh, uh, more um, uh, deeply. I would like to thank all of and everybody uh, for the attention. I would like to thank you, Raniero, and I hope that I have been clear. And I open to some questions if you want. If you have 10 mm -hmm. minutes, we can discuss something together. Any questions from the audience? <clears throat> 
just uh, just as a nice breaking, uh, I, I have a question for you, Sarah. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I, I have a friend who is the vice president of a, a Moroccan association of women entrepreneurs. Ah, okay. Association, association de femmes entrepreneurs. Oui. And she's obviously very, very uh, strong on uh, like gender issues and things like that. And she always says that uh, the, from the point of view of the law, the jurisdiction, yeah. uh, women are very, very much protected in, in Morocco. According to her, the, the law uh, is, is, is very much on that side. They have many laws to protect their rights. The problem is that uh, the civil society, and in particular the, the men's society, doesn't follow the same uh, the same line. Okay, so there is a, a dichotomy between what the government is trying to, uh, <coughs> I would say, perform, and what is the real situation in the, in the country. Can you can you comment on that? What yeah, do you think of course. Of Thank you very much, Raniero, for this Morocco is very well known to be one of the most advanced countries in MENA region in terms of uh, laws for uh, women's rights, um, but uh, with Tunisia, of course. Uh, but um, we can say, and we already said, for example, in case of the constitution, uh, we have gender equality that is written in the constitution, but then after 2011, we don't have in Morocco any other constitutional laws in order to put into practice this formal recognition. So we have a problem, as you said, um, in terms of uh, substantial gender equality and in terms of protection of women's rights in the daily life. For example, a lot of projects in terms of uh, promoting empowerment culture, the, the, the culture of women's empowerment in particular, uh, are trying to um, offer some trainings in this field to um, all the staff of the institutions, all the, for example, all in the police. We have a big problem with the policemen in terms of uh, what is the case when a woman goes to denounce uh, violence uh, that yeah. she no, and in this case, as I presented just a few minutes ago, uh, sometimes men, policemen, tries to say, "Bam, yes, but this is not a big problem." Or Islam allows men in order to be <laughs> violent with you, and there is not a, a, a cultural level in terms of what the meaning of empowerment, what's the meaning of gender equality, and also like in the rural areas or in south in the oasis like tata where where i was with this project people doesn't know that there is a, a reform of the family code in 2004 that there, there has there has been uh, this reform so women in particular if they are not educated they they doesn't they don't know sorry uh, they don't know their rights so uh, as your friend said of course law exists and sometimes law protects women but then there is the practice and the daily okay. life and this is a, yeah. a real problem and a cultural problem okay it will take time to uh to solve this problem i will close if there are no other questions from uh, the other participants i will close with a remark uh I I, actually Sorry, yes, go ahead. I, I, I have a question. Yeah. <laughs> Just that um, I was thinking about. Uh, first of all, thank you for this uh, powerful uh, talk. And um, I was just thinking about these notions of gender equality and empowerment because uh, I saw that, I mean, they can be used in such different contexts and uh, to promote very, very different aims and in different discourses. And I think um, that I was just wondering about. Um, their effect in uh, everyday life because i think that both of these notions are like very very strongly connected to now or associated with feminism and activism which uh which may have also like a isolating effect or or uh wondering uh 
do you, uh, or or do you have any uh, strategy? Or can you think of any strategies which would kind of break um, break with this? Um, that that, for example, in some women it may provoke a kind of um, fear, or they don't want to be involved so openly because these notions are so charged with uh, with feminism and yeah. Uh, yeah. Of course, this is a very interesting point that I, I was phase two uh, during my research on the field because, of course, the notion of feminist is connected with Western colonization and Western uh, cultural supremacy uh, or on the Western feminism and uh, the white feminism. But this is a very interesting point because now um, uh, we face inter intersectional feminism uh, in the mid Middle East and North Africa uh, countries, and we can see that decolonial perspective is informing social movements as well as intellectuals and um, uh, thinkers and critical thinkers. So we have uh, intersectionality and decoloniality that enter in social movements and in the uh, production of knowledge and in this sense i would like to but i, I sent well, you I my suggested readings that. but uh, for example um here you can say how feminism uh, um i, I was uh, observing how feminism could be understood at a plural level so how many feminists we face uh, when we observe women's movement in this region and um, even in one macro area like for example leftist movement or secular women's movement we find uh, conflicts convergences the negotiations so it, it's very complex the social reality as in in old context that we we can observe and in sense that you underline i suggest to observe um, this new kind of feminism that is post-ideological. After 2011, we don't have so much. We, of course, we have the divide secular Islamists. We have it uh, already today in Tunisia. We observe this divide very much, but we can also find other, uh, other forms of women's uh, rights struggles that <clears throat> are using the notion of intersectional feminism and the decolonial approach. So in order to uh, go beyond the, 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 the colonial approaches of white feminism and uh, post-colonial perspective, they go beyond or even the post-colonial in proposing a decolonial. So we have to produce a knowledge that is home-based, that is locally based, that is uh, created according with our uh, um, our em emancipatory priorities. So it, this is something very interesting to 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 observe because it's something that is uh, changing and reconfiguring the, the 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 panorama, the scenario of women's movement in this region. And uh, also, the transnational network are something uh, new, something mm, recent. Um, that we can observe recently and um, yeah how um, how at the global level these networks interact and influence uh, social movements we can say that <coughs> for example the me too movement has also some uh, echoes in the MENA region at the same time what um, what has uh, been done, for example, in Tunisia, uh, influenced all the entire region. So feminist movement in Tunisia and uh, feminist associations in Tunisia are collaborating with Morocco, with other Maghrebi associations. But this is something that is that has also a historical um, origin, of course, a, a historical um, base. But after 2011, these networks are are working together and uh, this is also another interesting point and these are the uh, maybe uh, sir you are interested in artivism uh, and this is the reference to 
to my work in this uh, in this field i was working on the lgbtq struggles for a new politics of recognition also in tunisia uh, through the festival uh, of arts uh, the feminist festival and the queer festival uh, that means look at them so um, this festival is a new uh, way to uh, promote uh, women and LGBTQ minorities visibility in the public space in order to uh, struggle through visibility in the public space for new spaces for women's rights and LGBTQ rights uh, that are of course in particular LGBTQ rights um, sanctioned by penal code in Tunisia as well as Mar in Morocco and in other uh, Muslim majority countries and i would like to thank you and if you have no more questions we can uh, stop the the presentation i don't know if chloe wants to add something and sorry for my english sometime when i'm talking along the two hours maybe sometime is missed and then i i i try to <laughs> to to change i have a presentation but with my passion sometimes i go beyond it and sometimes english go away goes away but uh, i hope that all has been clear and that the trajectory of our discourse and changes uh, that empowerment, gender equality, and um, uh, women's rights can assume in different contexts and according to different actors um, has been clear. Okay, so thank you very much and all the best to you. Hi. Thank and you. Thank you for your attention and enjoy thank your you. day. Thank you very much. much. Thank you. If you want to write me for any other uh, information, send sara.borrillo.gmail.com and I read this mail currently. Okay. Thank you. Thank bye. you. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.